Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the final webinar of our 2022 Focus webinar series. My name is Martha Foster, and I'm the board chair of RTO ERO. RTO ERO is committed to supporting healthy aging through our programs and services for our 82,000 members and for seniors across Canada. This brings us to today's webinar topic, Diabetes Prevention and Management, What You Should Know. Bienvenue à toutes et tous. Merci de vous joindre à nous aujourd'hui pour le dernier webinar de votre série de webinaires Focus 2022. Je m'appelle Martha Foster. Je suis la présidente du conseil d'administration d'Artio Hero. Artio Hero s'est engagé à promouvoir une vie active et en santé pour les années par le biais de ces programmes et services destinés à ces 82 000 membres et aux années de tout le Canada. Ceci nous amène au sujet du webinaire d'aujourd'hui, prévention et prise en charge de diabète, ce, qu ce que vous devez savoir. This webinar will be recorded and shared. But before we begin today, we would like to pay our respects to the Indigenous lands that connect us across Canada. We begin by recognizing that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples. We thank all generation of people that have taken care of the land. It is especially important to take this time at the beginning of our program to provide this Indigenous, indigenous acknowledgement. For RTO ERO, inclusion is not a single event, but rather a core value and a key part of our strategic plan. In the weeks and months ahead, we will continue to share resources to help us continue on our learning journey. We are finding new ways to engage and support Indigenous communities. I encourage each of you to take this moment of Indigenous acknowledgement to reflect on your own journey of learning. Miigwech. Muriel? Merci, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Nous commençons cet événement en reconnaissant que nous sommes réunis sur des terres autochtones qui ont été habitées par des peuples autochtones depuis le début. Nous remercions toutes les générations qui ont pris soin de ces terres. Il est particulièrement important que nous prenions le temps, au début de notre programme, d'offrir cette reconnaissance autochtone. Pour RTO, ERO, l'inclusion n'est pas l'événement d'un jour, mais plutôt une valeur fondamentale et un élément clé de notre plan stratégique. Dans les semaines et les mois à venir, nous continuerons à partager des ressources qui nous aideront à poursuivre notre parcours d'apprentissage. Nous trouverons de nouvelles façons d'engager et de soutenir les communautés autochtones. Un exemple de notre collaboration avec le Native Canadian Center of Toronto. J'encourage donc chacun d'entre vous à profiter de ce moment de reconnaissance des autochtones pour réfléchir à votre propre parcours d'apprentissage. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. Hello, everyone. My name is Muriel Howden. I am the Executive Assistant and Senior Outreach Advisor for RTO-ERO. I will be moderating today's session and providing an active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or have information relayed in French. Throughout the webinar, feel free to, feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions for our guest. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Je suis Muriel Howden, adjointe de direction et conseillère en liaison à RTO ERO. Je serai la modératrice de notre session d'aujourd'hui et je vous invite à poser vos questions ou à partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses afin de les soumettre à notre invité. Martha? Merci, Muriel. Our presenter today is Dr. Elena Wiseman. Dr. Elena Wiseman is an endocrinologist and a clinician scientist at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And she's an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism, the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Wiseman attended medical school at Queen's University and completed residencies in internal medicine and endocrinology and metabolism at the University of Toronto. Following her clinical training, she completed a PhD in clinical epidemiology and healthcare research in the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. 
Dr. Wiseman's clinical practice focuses on the management of diabetes. She also conducts research to evaluate and improve health outcomes for individuals living with diabetes. Dr. Wiseman, take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I'm pleased to be joining you today. So I'll be speaking today about diabetes prevention and management, what you should know. I do want to mention that I have accepted funding for my research from nonprofit organizations, which are listed here. However, I have not accepted any funding from any industry sponsors, and there should be no impact of these funding sources on my presentation today. I also want to uh, start with a medical disclosure. So this presentation includes general medical information, but does not constitute medical advice and is not a substitute for, for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment for which you should uh, seek care with your own healthcare provider. So to give you a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today, there are three sections to my presentation. First, we'll talk about di diabetes diagnosis and risk factors. Second, we'll talk about diabetes prevention. And finally, we'll talk about diabetes management. So my goal with my presentation today is that each of you can come away with having learned something. So for those of you without diabetes, I hope that you'll learn um, about risk factors for diabetes and how you could prevent diabetes. Or perhaps you might have a friend or family member with diabetes and you can learn some information that might be helpful in that context. For those of you who may already have diabetes, I hope to give you the viewpoint of a diabetes specialist. And I think that this type of information will be really helpful when you're seeing your own family doctor or diabetes specialist um, for, for, for what type of information they're looking at when you go to these appointments. So let's start off by talking about what is diabetes. Well, there are two main types of diabetes, type one diabetes and type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune process. So this is where the body produces antibodies that attack the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. This results in very low levels of insulin and therefore the treatment for type one diabetes is generally replacing insulin uh, because the body is no longer producing adequate amounts of insulin. Type 1 diabetes is the minority of all diabetes. It represents about 5 to 10% of all cases of diabetes. I'm actually not going to be speaking much about type 1 diabetes today since it is the minority of cases. So we'll talk mainly today about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 is 90 to 95% of all cases of diabetes. And rather than insulin deficiency like in type 1, the fundamental problem in type two diabetes is insulin resistance. So this can be due to a variety of factors, but basically the body no longer responds to insulin appropriately. If we were to measure the insulin levels in type two diabetes, they're normal or sometimes even elevated. And so therefore the treatment of type two diabetes is actually focused on trying to improve the response to insulin that the body is producing. And generally, if we use insulin in type 2 diabetes, it's further along the spectrum, um, typically after these other medications that aim to improve how the body responds to insulin are no longer working adequately. So why is managing uh, diabetes so important? Well, long-term high blood sugars, which we see in all cases of diabetes, um, predispose to risks of diabetes complications. And this can affect multiple areas within the body. So uh, long-term high blood sugars can lead to damage to the small blood vessels in the eyes. This is a condition called retinopathy. And if left untreated, this can lead to loss of vision. If we look at the nerves in the body, high blood sugars over the long-term can cause damage to the small nerves throughout the body. This is usually called neuropathy. The earliest sign of this tends to be sensation of numbness, tingling, or pins and needle fe feeling, usually starting in the feet, and then it can progress up the body and it can also start to affect the hands. If this is left untreated and goes severe, this can lead to impaired sensation in the feet, which can predispose to the formation of foot ulcers or sores in the feet. Diabetes can also cause damage to the kidneys, and this is called nephropathy. 
Usually the first sign of, of potential damage to the kidneys in diabetes would be that the kidneys are leaking abnormal amounts of protein into the urine. We also can measure the function of the, kid, the kidneys, and we can see that over long term of diabetes, kidney function may be impaired. If we look at the bottom row of diagrams here, we know that diabetes is also a strong risk factor for atherosclerosis or development of plaques throughout the larger blood vessels in the body. And so people with diabetes are at higher risk of heart attacks, of strokes, and of circulation problems in the, in the legs. And this is all due to atherosclerosis or buildup of plaques in these large arteries. So this is why it's so important uh, to identify diabetes and treat diabetes effectively so that we can prevent these diabetes complications from occurring. How do we diagnose diabetes? Well, there are a number of ways that diabetes can be diagnosed. So the first type of test that can be performed is a fasting blood glucose. So this is where someone fasts for at least eight hours, they go to the lab, have a blood sample drawn, and the sugar in the blood at that particular moment in time is measured. Now we know that there is going to be some variation in this test as a fasting blood glucose test only tells us what your blood glucose is at that particular moment in time. And we know that it can vary. So if you had this test done, let's say two days in a row, there could be some differences in this number day to day. The second option is an oral glucose tolerance test. So that's um, where you go to the laboratory, again, fasting, the fasting blood glucose uh, is drawn. Then you consume this drink, which has a standardized amount of glucose. And two hours after having this drink, the blood glucose is measured in the blood again. And this tells us how your body responds to a large blood glucose load. This test is not very commonly performed anymore outside of certain situations, particularly pregnancy. So um, perhaps some of the women in the group, if you've had pregnancies, might recall doing a similar type of test in pregnancy to screen for gestational diabetes. But outside of pregnancy, this is very rarely done. So we're not going to talk too much in detail about this type of test again today. The third test is the hemoglobin A1C which is sometimes referred to as HbA1c for short, or even just A1c for short. And this is a really key test in diabetes. So I'm going to take a moment here to really describe it and make sure you understand what the A1c test is measuring. So hemoglobin is your red blood cells. Your red blood cells live on average two to three months, and then you're constantly generating new red blood cells. So each one has a lifespan of about two to three months. Hemoglobin is sticky. So as your red blood cells are floating around in your bloodstream, glucose or sugar in your blood will stick to the red blood cells. And as you can see here, if you don't have a lot of sugar in your blood, there won't be too much sugar stuck to the hemoglobin. In contrast, someone with diabetes, if they have a high amount of blood sugar floating around in their blood, a lot more of that sugar is going to stick to hemoglobin. And we can measure this, how much hemoglobin, uh, sorry, how much sugar is stuck to the hemoglobin. And because the, the hemoglobin or red blood cells live for two to three months, this measure gives us an average measurement of the blood sugar over the past two to three months. So this gives us a much longer term measure of average blood sugar. So now that we've talked about how we can test for diabetes, let's talk about the diagnosis of diabetes or some of the conditions associated with risk of diabetes. I mentioned that glucose tolerance test where you do the glucose drink is not commonly used anymore. So I'm not even going to talk about the uh, numbers that are used to diagnose diabetes using that test, although it is an option, just not commonly used. So the two main tests that we use to screen for or diagnose diabetes are the fasting glucose test and that hemoglobin A1C, which is the more longer term average blood sugar over the past two to three months. These numbers, both for the glucose and for the A1C, are a continuum. So they, you know, generally the lower the number, the lower someone's risk of developing diabetes. So if we start off with the fasting glucose, normal is, can, is anything under six. However, even within the normal range, 
someone who's in that higher end of normal between 5.6 and 6 on the fasting glucose test could be considered to be at risk. Someone who's between 6 and 7 is, is diagnosed with prediabetes. So they're not meeting the full criteria for having diabetes yet, but they're outside of the normal range. And then finally, if this number is over seven, that is the cut point to diagnose diabetes. If we look at the A1C test, normal is under 6%. But again, even within the normal range, if you're in this higher end of the normal range, we could say that you might be at risk of developing prediabetes or diabetes. Prediabetes with A1C is defined by a value between 6 and 6.4%. And then anything over 6.5% is diagnostic for diabetes. It's important to note that to diagnose diabetes for the first time, we usually like to see at least two tests being abnormal um, in order to confirm this. So either that could be on the same day the fasting glucose and the A1C are both above these cut points to diagnose diabetes, or it could be that you've had the same test done, but on two different days or two different occasions, um, and both times they're abnormal. So we need two tests with fasting glucose above seven or A1C above 6.5% to diagnose diabetes. Now there are a number of risk factors for diabetes and I'll, I've listed the major risk factors here. So the first one being age. Um, in Canada, about 20% of the population over the age of 65 has diabetes. So over the age of 65, one in five people have diabetes. That proportion or that percentage goes up as age increases. So age is a very strong risk factor for diabetes. Family history is also a major risk factor for diabetes. So if you have parents, siblings, or other first degree family members that have diabetes, this places you at higher risk. Certain ethnicities are at high risk of diabetes. This includes Asian and South Asian ethnicities. Indigenous people in Canada are also at high risk of diabetes, as well as Arab and African populations. If you have prediabetes, that puts you at very high risk of developing diabetes. Um, so again, moving along that continuum, when we look at the A1C and fasting glucose values, if you're in the prediabetes range, you're at much higher risk of converting to diabetes. For women who've had pregnancies in the past, if they had a history of gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy, that is a risk factor for developing diabetes later in life. And finally, being overweight or obese is also a major risk factor for diabetes. How often should you be tested for diabetes? So the recommendations are that over the age of 40, everyone should be screened for diabetes at least every three years, assuming they have no other risk factors. Um, so if you have no risk factors and you're over the age of 40, it's recommended to have that hemoglobin A1C test and a fasting glucose test done every three years. Now, if you do have some risk factors that I've mentioned on the slide before, so higher age, family history, history of gestational diabetes, overweight or obesity, or high risk ethnicity, then it's recommended that these same tests be performed every year. I wanted to highlight that there is a diabetes risk calculator um, that's been published by the Canadian government. And so if you were to go onto this website, you can plug in your personal information. And in addition to providing some general diabetes information, which is really helpful, it will also calculate your personal risk score for developing diabetes um, and tell you whether you're low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for developing diabetes. So I put the websites here as well as QR codes. So if any of you are watching uh, with your phone, you could, um, pull up your camera, hover it over this uh, QR code, and it would take you straight to this uh, risk calculator. Um, and, then, and then you can have an idea of your personal risk for developing diabetes. So let's talk about preventing diabetes. If we go back to the fasting glucose and A1C blood tests we talked about before, where we're focusing now 
are on the people who on these blood tests are normal, at risk, or even in the pre-diabetes range. So diabetes prevention can apply to all of these people. Diabetes prevention consists of lifestyle management and medication potentially. So lifestyle management is a term we use that includes weight management, dietary management, and physical activity or exercise. So let's start with weight loss, and I'm going to keep this pretty simplistic. There are a number of dietary, sorry, there are um, a number of um, studies that have shown that weight loss of 5% if you're overweight or obese is effective for preventing diabetes. Um, it's important to note the 5%. So I find that patients often have very substantial weight loss goals. They may talk about wanting to lose 20, 30 pounds. But for someone who, let's say, weighs 150 pounds, a 5% weight loss is only seven and a half pounds. So it's important to, to recognize that weight loss goals can be more modest. They don't have to be very substantial amounts of weight loss to have health benefits in terms of preventing diabetes. I also do want to acknowledge that not everyone with diabetes is overweight or obese, of course. So weight management generally applies to people who are overweight or obese. It does not necessarily apply to those um, who have a normal body weight. The other key point about weight loss or weight management to prevent diabetes is that weight loss needs to be sustained in order to have long-term benefit. Um, and in fact, weight cycling, which is repeated cycles of weight loss followed by weight regain, is actually more harmful than having not lost weight in the first place. So I, when I talk about weight management with patients, I always recommend modest changes that are going to be sustainable. So really dramatic um, weight loss goals that are accomplished by really dramatic weight uh, lifestyle changes that are not sustainable over the long term are generally not what I would recommend in this scenario. So dietary management. There are a number of diets that have been shown to have benefit for preventing diabetes. The diets that have been studied and have shown to prevent diabetes are the Mediterranean diet, a low carbohydrate diet, the DASH diet, which you may have heard of specifically for high blood pressure, and a diet called the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. So these are the four diets that have been studied and shown to have benefit for preventing diabetes. Now, interestingly, what these diets all have in common is that they generally maximize whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, olive oil, white meat, and seafood and they all minimize alcohol, red or processed meats, and sugar-sweetened beverages. So this common dietary pattern seems to be the most beneficial for preventing diabetes. And the last prong of lifestyle management is physical activity. So it's recommended to perform at least 150 minutes per week of moderately intense physical activity. Moderately intense physical activity, for example, includes brisk walking, light bicycling, or even activities like mowing the lawn or gardening or vacuuming. So all of this together, we're aiming for at least 150 minutes per week. It is also recommended to perform resistance exercise and to reduce prolonged sitting. So you don't wanna be sitting at your desk um, for hours at a time. It's recommended to try and get up, take breaks, and be physically active. So that was the lifestyle management. Now, sometimes medications may also be used in those with prediabetes to prevent the conversion to diabetes. There are two medications that have been studied for this use. The first is metformin. Metformin is a medication that has been around for a very long time, it's very commonly used in the treatment of diabetes. It's a pill that is typically taken twice daily, and it has been shown to prevent the conversion from prediabetes to diabetes by about 60%. So it is sometimes used in people with prediabetes if the lifestyle measures are not successful on their own. 
The other medication that has been shown to prevent the conversion from prediabetes to diabetes are a class of medications called GLP-1 receptor agonists. You may have heard or seen commercials for some of these medications, such as Ozempic, Victoza, or Trulicity. These are injectable medications that are injected either once a day or once per week, and they also have been studied for preventing diabetes. These medications are also generally very effective as weight loss medications. So they've even been approved for use in people without diabetes who are overweight or obese um, as a weight loss medication. So we've talked about preventing diabetes. Let's move on to the category of people who have already been diagnosed with diabetes because they have a fasting glucose higher than seven or a hemoglobin A1C that is 6.5% or higher. So the mainstay of diabetes management is still that lifestyle modification. And again, this is actually the exact same recommendations that we give for preventing diabetes. So the lifestyle modification includes weight loss targets of 5% or more, at least 150 minutes per week of moderately intense physical activity, and a healthy dietary pattern, which is the exact same dietary pattern I just discussed for diabetes prevention. So for most people with a new diagnosis of type two diabetes, it's generally recommended that these lifestyle modifications be used at least for the first three months to see if there can be substantial improvement in the blood sugar test and the hemoglobin A1C test. So we usually call this a trial of lifestyle modification, before recommending medications for someone newly diagnosed with type two diabetes. So obviously there's uh, medications we can use to treat type two diabetes, and there is a whole list of medications. So I won't go into a lot of detail about each of these, but generally the medications can be described um, as either oral medications, so pills that are taken either once or several times per day, or injectable medications. I mentioned for the injections already, the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So that's our main injectable medication for type two diabetes. Um, and then the other injectables would be insulin, which I mentioned earlier as well. So in terms of selecting which medications someone might use for type two diabetes, it's very individualized and a lot of factors are taken into account when recommending which medication someone may need for diabetes. So it's not the same for everyone, and that's why I won't go into a ton of detail about these today. Um, it depends on factors like your weight and whether weight loss is a, is a major goal, whether you have a history of heart disease or kidney disease, um, what the risk of causing low blood sugars is, for example, so all of these factors should be considered when a physician or other healthcare provider is recommending uh, medications to manage blood sugars in, in type two diabetes. So what should your diabetes care look like? Well, ideally, if someone has been newly diagnosed with diabetes, they should attend a diabetes education program. So these are generally uh, run by the government at no cost. And a lot of the times these programs can be by self-referral. You don't necessarily require a referral from your physician. Um, and these programs usually include dietary counseling, uh, weight loss counseling, and a lot of education about measuring and monitoring blood sugars. So I do highly recommend that everyone who's newly diagnosed with diabetes attend one of these diabetes education programs. Diabetes care then should also include regular follow-up appointments with whichever healthcare provider is managing your diabetes. So for a lot of people, this might be their family doctor who's the main person managing their diabetes. But for others, this might be a diabetes specialist like myself, an endocrinologist, or perhaps an internist. We typically measure that blood test, the A1C, every three to six months in people with diabetes. And how often within that three to six month span it's being measured usually depends on the stability of the blood sugars over time and the types of medication someone is testing, taking. 
Finally, there should also be annual testing for diabetes complications. And I'll talk about what those tests are in a moment. How can you prepare for your diabetes appointments with either your family doctor or your diabetes specialist? Well, it's really helpful to bring a list of current medications with you to each appointment, or even actually bring the medications themselves with you to each appointment. If you are measuring blood sugars, it's very helpful to have some sort of way of showing the, the blood sugar records, whether that's electronically, handwritten, or even bringing in the blood glucose meter for the uh, doctor to look through. Similarly, if you're measuring blood pressure at home, particularly during this virtual era, if some of your appointments are occurring virtually and your doctor is not measuring your blood pressure in the clinic, if you do have a blood pressure machine at home and are measuring your blood pressure, or perhaps you're going to the pharmacy once in a while to measure your blood pressure, it's really helpful to also have those numbers written down and ready to share. And then finally, I also would recommend having a list of all of the physicians involved in your care. So if you do have other specialists involved for any other health conditions, it's very helpful to be prepared to have those names as well uh, for each appointment. So let's go back to the uh, A1C um, and blood sugar value testing. So I talked about how important this A1C test was for diagnosing diabetes if it's 6.5% or higher. The A1C test is also really a key piece of information for people with diabetes um, as we manage diabetes over time. For most people with diabetes, the target A1C is less than or equal to 7%. So for the vast majority of people with diabetes, we're recommending lifestyle changes and medications to control blood sugars. And our goal is to get the A1C value to 7% or lower. Now I mentioned the A1C is an, is an average measurement over the past two to three months. It's only measured every few months. And so this is obviously not very helpful for someone with diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not going to be guiding their day-to-day -day decisions or information about how their blood sugars are doing. So the other uh, targets we can look at are, are actually the blood sugars if somebody is measuring them. So if someone's measuring blood sugars, then if they were to check their blood sugar before they eat a meal, the target range for that number is for it to be between four and seven. If someone's checking their blood sugar after they've eaten a meal, we recommend waiting at least two hours after eating. So not checking within the two hours after eating a meal. And if you do check two hours after eating, then the target blood sugar range is to have your sugar between five and 10. I mentioned checking blood sugar, so let's talk about that for a moment. So first off, how often should you be checking your blood sugars? That's, that's a very, again, individualized question. Um, for people who are taking medications for diabetes that don't cause a risk of low blood sugars, for example, metformin would be one of those medications. Or there may be some people who are just doing lifestyle modification and they may not even be taking any medications for blood sugars, then it's actually not recommended to routinely check your blood sugar at home. Um, sometimes people may want to check their blood sugar and that would be more so for education. Um, so to see if you've made some dietary changes or you've exercised and you want to see what effect that's had on your blood sugar. Or conversely, Maybe you ate something you know was probably not the best thing to eat and you wanna see what effect that had on your blood sugars. So then you may measure your blood sugars once in a while, more so for your own learning and for your own education. But for people on medications like metformin or not on any medications, it's actually not recommended that you need to measure your blood sugar regularly. For people who are on medications that do cause a risk of low blood sugars, uh, for example, insulin or some of the uh, other pills that can cause low blood sugars, then we usually do recommend regularly checking blood sugars. And that can range from once a day to up to four times a day, depending on the type of uh, medication regimen someone is on. 
how do we actually measure blood sugars? There's primarily two ways. So the traditional method is shown in this uh, diagram here, um, which is a capillary glucose meter. This is where you use a lancet to prick your finger to have a drop of blood. And then you actually check your, your blood sugar by poking your finger. That is still appropriate for, for many people, um, in particular people who are not on insulin and who are not needing to check their blood sugars very frequently. I did want to briefly mention some of the newer methods of how to check blood sugars. Um, and there's primarily two ways of doing this in Canada. We have these glucose monitors. The first one here is the Freestyle Libre, which some people may be familiar with. And the one shown here is called the Dexcom. These are what are called continuous glucose monitors. So these are, are devices that are inserted using a needle um, into the arm or to the abdomen. The needle is then withdrawn and you're left behind with a little catheter that goes under the skin. And these devices are worn for either 14 days for the Freestyle Libre or 10 days for the Dexcom sensor. And so during this time, while you're wearing the glucose sensor, it's monitoring the blood sugars every minute. Um, and then you can basically capture what your blood sugar is doing minute to minute without having to uh, poke your finger. So these are in particular helpful for people generally who are using insulin because they would need to be checking their blood sugars more frequently. In Ontario, the Freestyle Libre is covered on the Ontario Drug Benefit Program for everyone over the age of 65 who is using insulin. Um, and I think in other provinces, there may be some differences, but we're starting to see a lot more government coverage of these sensors for people using insulin. I mentioned the A1C target, so the blood sugar target in diabetes. We do have a few other targets as well. So I wanted to walk you through some of the other things we're looking at and what we're trying to achieve. So cholesterol, everyone with diabetes over the age of 40 is recommended to be on medication for cholesterol using a family of medication called statins. You've probably heard of some of the statins. This includes Lipitor and Crestor, for example, would be uh, two very common statins that are used. So everyone over the age of 40 with diabetes, it's recommended to be on a statin and that's actually no matter what your cholesterol numbers are to start with. So your cholesterol numbers could be pretty good or they could even be very good. And the recommendation is still to take a cholesterol medication. So why is that? That's because as I mentioned before, diabetes is a strong risk factor for atherosclerosis or plaques in the arteries that predisposes to heart attacks and strokes. We know that the statin type of medications substantially reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes, and you see that same reduction no matter what the starting cholesterol is. So that's why it is recommended for everyone with diabetes over the age of 40. Once somebody is on one of these medications, the main marker we're using to adjust the dose or to determine if the dose is effective is the LDL cholesterol, which is the so-called bad cholesterol. So we're looking for that number for the bad cholesterol to be under two in people with diabetes. We also have a target blood pressure. So in anyone with diabetes, if the blood pressure is greater than 130 over 80, 130 is the systolic blood pressure. So that's that top number you'll see. And 80 is the diastolic blood pressure, which is that bottom number. If it's over 130 over 80, then that's generally when we would recommend starting blood pressure medications. And once someone is on blood pressure medications, we're targeting that the blood pressure should be under that 130 over 80. So we're often increasing doses or potentially adding other uh, blood pressure medications until the blood pressure is consistently under 130 over 80. I mentioned earlier that there should be annual screening for some of the diabetes complications. So th this is the specifics of what's recommended in terms of screening for diabetes complications. First is that there should be an annual dilated eye exam. 
Um, so this screens for that complication called retinopathy, which is damage to the small blood vessels in the eyes. It's important to note the dilated part. So this type of eye exam requires drops in the eyes where you end up with blurry vision for a few hours so that someone can examine the back of the eye. Sometimes people might get a more simple vision check or a new glasses prescription and they'll think, oh, they've had their eyes checked for diabetes. But if you haven't been given the drops to dilate your eye, then it is not the type of eye exam that's required for diabetes. In Ontario, at least, this eye exam is covered by the government for everyone over, uh, sorry, for anyone of any age who has diabetes. I'm not sure if it's the same in all provinces. I also want to mention that the dilated eye exam can be done by an optometrist um, and usually only if there are specific issues or concerns identified, then there would be a referral to an ophthalmologist. So generally, I recommend people choose someone who's convenient, close to home, an optometrist who's nearby um, to go for their regular eye exams. And then only if there is an issue do we usually then refer to an ophthalmologist. We also do annual tests on the kidneys to screen for that complication of nephropathy or kidney impairment. So this consists of both a blood test where we measure something called the creatinine to look at how well the kidneys are functioning. And then we also do a urine test where we're looking to see if there's any abnormal amounts of protein leaking into the urine from the kidneys. And this urine test is called an albumin to creatinine ratio or ACR. Sometimes it's called microalbumin to creatinine ratio or MCR. So that test is looking for abnormal amounts of protein in the urine as an early marker of potential damage to the kidneys. And then finally, I mentioned that there can be impaired sensation in the foot due to that diabetes complication called neuropathy. And so at least once a year, someone should be checking your feet Typically, it's done with this instrument called a 10-gram monofilament. Um, so that's where this uh, filament is applied either to the top or the bottom of the foot until it bends. That, that produces a standardized weight on the foot. And we're checking to see if you can feel it, essentially. If someone cannot feel the 10-gram monofilament, then we know that that is a marker of having reduced sensation in the foot and potentially that person could be predisposed to the risk of foot ulcers. So they would be considered higher risk for foot ulcers. So a nice way to summarize everything I've talked about so far for managing diabetes, we have this nice mnemonic, the ABCDEs, which is um, published by Diabetes Canada. So the A stands for A1C, which we're targeting to be less than or equal to 7%. The B stands for blood pressure. We're targeting for it to be under 130 over 80. The C stands for cholesterol. So we're looking for that LDL or bad cholesterol to be under two. The D is for drugs to protect your heart. So that actually includes the cholesterol medications. I didn't talk in detail about this today, but there are some other diabetes medications that are particularly beneficial for the heart. And so they may be used um, in people with high risk of heart disease or who have already had a history of heart disease. The E stands for exercise and eating. So we discussed that as part of the lifestyle modification. And the S's we didn't talk about today, but they are to stop smoking and manage stress. So if you're struggling to remember all of the aspects of managing diabetes, the ABCDEs might be a helpful way for you to remember. So to end, I was going to touch on two common myth, myths of diabetes. Um, and then at the end, if there's any myths you have heard of that you're questioning, I'd be happy to address any other common ones. But here are two really common ones I hear from my patients. So myth number one, Medications will make my diabetes worse because my body will become dependent on them. So I hear this quite frequently, people being reluctant to start medications because they worry they will become dependent on them. And that is absolutely not true. There is no dependence or tolerance to medications that we use for diabetes. 
And then second common myth, if I start insulin, I will never be able to come off of insulin. So that's actually also not true. I would say in general, if someone is starting insulin, it, it's probably good to have the mindset that it may be for the long term, but it is certainly not always the case. And I'll give two uh, common reasons for that. One is um, often uh, when people are diagnosed with diabetes, sometimes they'll have really, really high blood sugars, particularly if they hadn't been going to the doctor regularly. And so they had developed diabetes and it takes a long time before it gets picked up on a blood test. By the time it's diagnosed, their blood sugars could be very high. In that scenario, we almost always start insulin um, to get the blood sugars under control more quickly. But especially if people can then institute some changes to their lifestyle with diet, exercise, and weight, it's not uncommon that we'll be able to, to slowly wean down the insulin and even stop insulin. So I've had many cases of that. The other really common reason I will say is that there's been so much research and development in new diabetes medications. And so especially in the last five years, there are uh, people who had been started on insulin years ago because they had been maxed out on all the other medications that were available at that time. But now we have all of these newer, really effective medications. And so we're able to start adding in these newer medications, start pulling back on the insulin. And actually in quite a number of people, I've been able to stop insulin. You know, they'd been using it for years, but now we have these new medications that we can use instead. So that's all the slides I have for today. Um, so I will um, stop sharing and then I think we have lots of time for uh, questions. Well, this is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your very insightful presentation with so much information. Um, I see that we've received some great questions for Dr. Alana Wiseman. So we will try to get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have today. A uh, quick reminder, I would like to remind you to submit your questions in English or in French using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And the chat will not really be monitored, so we're asking you to use the Q&A box. Thank you so much for that. Je vous rappelle que vous pouvez poser vos questions à Dr. Alana Wiseman ou partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses située au bas de votre écran. So, Alana, I'm going to start with the first question, um, and it was, can you speak to the side effects of the diabetes medication? So, of medications in general. So, yeah. um, that's a big question because, uh, as I said, there are quite a number of medications, and each one um, has their own side effect profile. So, I think if there's a particular medication someone's interested in, you could speak to your pharmacist and, and you could speak to your, your doctor, obviously, as well. Um, I would say, you know, some of the big categories of side effects we, you know, we see one would be gastrointestinal. Uh, so particularly for metformin, for example, and for these GLP-1 receptor agonists, those injectable weight loss and diabetes medica medications, we do see a lot of potential uh, gastrointestinal side effects. So that would be things like loose stools or diarrhea, upset stomach, um, sometimes constipation. So you can get, you know, bowel movements heading in both directions. Um, so that would be one category. Um, the other really common side effect we worry about are, is, is hypoglycemia or the risk of these diet, some of the diabetes medications actually causing the blood sugar to go too low, which can be dangerous. So there are some medications that are known to cause hypoglycemia, and there are some that do not. And generally, we try to focus initially on using the medications that do not have that risk of hypoglycemia. Um, but sometimes we do end up having to use, for example, insulin or other pills that do have a risk of hypoglycemia. So hopefully that that helped. I mean, each individual type of medication does have, you know, its its side effect profile that can differ. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Thank you very much. The next question is actually kind of a follow up to this first question. And it is, how do diabetes medications interact with other medications because older, older adults are often on more than one medication? Yeah, that's a great question. Most of the time there, there isn't a major concern for interaction. I would say 
you know, the common combinations we'll see in someone with diabetes would be the blood sugar lowering medications, the blood pressure medications, the cholesterol medications. Generally, there isn't a lot of concern about interactions for those. Um, sometimes if someone is on other heart medications, like to slow the heart rate or to regulate the heart rate, we may start to see some more interactions. Um, but I would say for the common type of medications, there, it's usually not a concern. Again, your pharmacist here would be, you know, your greatest ally if you have any concerns. Every time you start a new medication, um, it would be wise to, you know, go through the whole list with your pharmacist um, and they should be able to check if there's any concern for interactions. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, actually, the next one is for you, Elena. The one after is actually for the chair of the board, uh, Martha Foster, and for our CEO, Jim Green. So I'll call them after this one. But um, for this question, uh, Elena, could you please repeat the four types of diets and give us a bit more information on each of them? Yep, so the four were the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, D-A-S-H, the Alternative Healthy Eating Index, or AHEI, and a low carbohydrate diet. Um, the, the DASH diet was originally um, focused on lowering blood pressure, so it focuses on a low salt intake generally. The Mediterranean diet is actually like very much that diagram I showed. So you can picture the way people in, you know, in Greece or other Mediterranean areas would have eaten a lot of olive oil and olives, a lot of fish, a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot less meat. Um, so it's generally very descriptive of that photo I showed. Um, low carbohydrates, there's been a lot of interest in this, particularly in the last few years, and an extreme version of a low carbohydrate diet would be the keto diet, where you're actually like very restrictive of carbohydrates to the point of essentially starvation. Ketones or keto is an indication of, of starvation. Um, usually I caution about the keto diet, but a low carbohydrate diet has been shown to be helpful for both weight loss and for lowering blood sugars. Um, so those were the four, you know, you could look those up to look for specific details. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. So for the next one, I actually will call Martha Foster, Chair of the Board, and Jim Grieve, our CEO at RTO Yarrow. And um, so here's the, the question. Recently, a student recipient of an RTO Yarrow scholarship presented the results of her research on diabetes in older adults. So what are the other ways that RTO Yarrow supports seniors active living in retirement? Martha? Okay, and I'll start with that. And first of all, just what you said, that we did um, actually sponsor a student to do research. And we, along with the National Institute on Aging, every summer sponsor four um, young people who are just getting into studying either medicine or nursing or sociological things with respect to older adults. We sponsor them to do research in the different areas um, that affect. And we had the one student who did diabetes this year, Nicole, her name was. And um, that so that's one way we do. And we actually put our money where our mouth is. That's exactly what we, we um, support. A lot of the active, this question was about active living. And a lot of the work that's done that is done by our amazing districts across Canada, because we have 51 districts that are spread from C to C, I would say C to C to C. And um, they, they do things like uh, walking clubs and some of them even have mall walking clubs for those individuals who might have walkers or have a little more difficulty on rough terrain. Um, pickleball, I play a local pickleball with, with our TO folks and that's um, an amazing way to get exercise and stay fit. So there's a lot of physical activities that happen at local districts. But we also do a lot of other not so physical, but mentally active things, again, done by the districts where they have book clubs, reading clubs, um, so many different things where uh, members get together, support each other and, and do activities that keep them active and, and busy, which is awesome. Going to go to Jim for some more. Sure. I just I just add a couple of things. First of all, um, Dr. Weissman, we have a very interesting population, a wonderful population of you know, almost 83,000 members, about 200 of them are over 100 years old. So 
we have the sort of adage in our brain that teaching has been really good for your health in many respects, good news. But um, as Martha said, putting our money where our mouth is, uh, we endowed a chair in geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto Women's College Hospital. And Dr. Paula Rochon is uh, occupying that chair for the second of uh, five year term, which is great. And she started a women's age lab, which is unique in the world at this point, and deeply studying um, not just the issues in uh, health issues in older female um, adults, but there's a pretty significant spinoff for male adults who are aging as well. So that research uh, is ongoing. And the wonderful thing about having a partnership like this is that the product of the research, we can then disseminate to all of our members and good, wise advice like you've just given us today. Now, Martha's mentioned the Summer Scholars research. Well, I won't do that again. But I would say that the Summer Scholars are supervised by great um, geriatricians and medical specialists like you. Um, in fact, Dr. Samir Sinha is one of the, uh, the specialists who looks to the issues of um, geriatric medicine and geriatric healthcare and is one of the supervisors of the scholars. Last, last thing I would point to is we have an amazing foundation, a charitable foundation. And the sole object there is to make sure that we are putting out into uh, the research fields and into um, community projects, great, great ideas and funded ideas that really reflect on how we can have our seniors in Canada be healthy and active and you know, deal with some of the issues that you've, you've so well presented here today. So uh, donations through the foundation really are supportive. And again, we pick up on uh, the results of those projects and the results of that research and funnel it right back out to our, um, our almost 83,000 members. So healthy active living is what we are mostly about. And your topic today is absolutely critical for, uh, for getting us deeply better informed on diabetes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha and Jim. Um, Alana, one more question about diet. It's um, a big topic and then we'll, we'll have a completely different one after that. So uh, the question is fasting and intermittent fasting is um, our very popular trends right now. Would it help with diabetes prevention? Is that okay for people with diabetes to fast? Yeah, so keto diet, and then I would say the intermittent fasting have been very sort of like hot topics over the last few years. There have not been any studies yet looking at intermittent fasting. So that's why like the four dietary patterns I remember I, I listed are the ones that have been studied and shown to be effective. There may be a study of intermittent fasting in the future. So I think, you know, for some people it is effective. Um, so it's it's worth trying. Um, again, it has to be something that's sustainable in order to be of benefit. So if it's something you're going to try, the idea is that it has to be something you're able to sustain for the long run. And then whether someone with diabetes could um, do intermittent fasting, they can. It depends somewhat on the medications you're taking. Again, the key concern with fasting would be, are you at risk of hypoglycemia while you're fasting or low blood sugars? And really, you're only at risk of that if you're taking medications like insulin or there's medications like glycolyzide, diamicron, um, that, that can lower your blood sugar when you're not eating. Um, if you are taking those, it may not be the best idea without adjusting the medications. But if you're on other medications that don't cause low blood sugars, then generally it wouldn't be a concern to do intermittent fasting. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, how does one recognize the signs or effects of diabetic neuropathy? Yeah, so the first symptom usually of diabetic neuropathy is, is the numbness, tingling, or sometimes described as pins and needles sensation in the feet. That would be the most common. Um, again, you should be having that testing done once a year in the clinic with the, with uh, some sort of a test of sensation of the feet. So it also could be picked up that way by regular testing in the clinic. But in terms of symptoms, most commonly it would start in the feet and it affects the longest nerves in the body first, which sort of makes sense. Those, you know, the longer the nerves, the more work it is to sort of transmit 
And so you, if you think about it, it affects the farthest part first, and then it slowly gets closer and closer. So people will often notice it first in their, uh, like the tip of their toes that they might start to feel some numbness or tingling. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, next question. If someone is on medication for diabetes treatment, diabetes treatment, and um, are there circumstances in which they can improve their situation to the point where they can reduce or even completely stop the medication? Yep. Absolutely. So we would call that diabetes remission. Um, so it is possible to put diabetes into remission. Usually that requires substantial lifestyle changes that can be sustained. So again, if there's a, a substantial weight loss and it's sustained, that can put diabetes into remission. Um, if someone makes substantial dietary changes or substantially increases their physical activity, then it is possible that you could put diabetes into remission. So diabetes remission would be having an A1C under 6.5% without needing to be on diabetes medications. So it is possible. I would say it's not that common, but it is possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question actually came to us in French. So I'll read it in French first and then in English. So, comment puis-je soutenir un membre de ma famille atteint de diabète? How can I support a family member with diabetes? That's a great question. Um, I think first off, just having some awareness and knowledge about diabetes. So hopefully the information today will be helpful. Um, if someone you live with is on medications that do cause a risk of low blood sugars, that's a really important thing to be aware of. So to know what the symptoms of low blood sugars are and to recognize them. And then to know how to help treat a low blood sugar if someone had a, a low blood sugar episode that they needed help with because it was particularly severe. Um, so I think in particular for low blood sugars, there's a lot. Um, if you live with someone with diabetes, that would be very helpful. If it's not, you know, specifically about low blood sugar, I think trying to model the healthy sort of lifestyle is also really helpful. Um, so trying to, you know, as a family, perhaps decide to focus on that healthy eating pattern that's good for diabetes, trying to be physically active. Those things are actually good for your health in general, right? Not just diabetes, it's good for blood pressure, good for weight loss, um, good for arthritis, for example. So I think, you know, if you can sort of model that and take it on together and have that support within the family, then that's also beneficial. That's great. Thank you. Um, next question. Can you speak about dietary supplements and their impact on diabetes and diabetes prevention? Dietary supplements. So there are no dietary supplements that have been shown to prevent diabetes. Um, I know sometimes there are some alternative uh, or, or, you know, natural types of products that um, people are interested in using. None have been demonstrated in studies to conclusively be of benefit. So it's not, I, I don't routinely recommend any types of dietary supplements. Um, sometimes people want to take them and then just let your doctor know at least that you're taking them. Rarely, there are some that could have some potential harms. So that's why I would want to know about them, at least to be able to check for that. But otherwise, if it's not causing any harm and someone wants to take them, you know, I can, I support them generally, but I would say that we don't have the studies to, to back it up. And so I don't recommend them routinely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just cognizant of the time. We're down to probably the last 10 minutes um, of our webinar, but we have time for a few final questions. Um, so here's one for you, uh, Dr. Wiseman. Um, where do you look for the diabetes education programs? Like, do you go to hospital? Do you go to health units? Yeah, so I am, I'm based in Ontario. So I, I, my knowledge of other provinces is a bit more limited, which I apologize. First off, I would say check the Diabetes Canada website. So they have a lot of good information for all of the provinces. Um, in Ontario, it's, it's government run programs through community sites. And so you usually can just look up for your area what diabetes education programs there are. And then usually there's an online form or a phone number you can call and self-refer. 
I imagine it's similar in other provinces, um, but I can't say that with absolute certainty. It's sometimes they are in hospitals, but they're not generally, they're not hospital programs. They're usually embedded within communities. So they might be at community health centers or, or clinics um, within the community. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, what are the main organs? Oh, you know what? Um, that question, actually, I'm so sorry, came in French. So let me read it in French first. Quels sont les principaux organes qui jouent un rôle important dans la façon dont notre corps traite le sucre? So what are the main organs that play an important role in how our body processes sugar? So, I mean, the pancreas would be the most important because the pancreas is where we uh, produce insulin and insulin is what is needed to lower blood sugar in particular after you've eaten. Um, the liver is also really important. Um, so the, the liver helps with um, sensing blood sugar levels and controlling the amount of insulin that's released. So those would be the two main organs. Some of the research um, over the last few years has actually also shown that the, uh, the gut or the bowel, for example, also releases hormones that have a role in how blood sugar is processed and so, for example, these newer medications, I mentioned the GLP-1 receptor agonists, those were all based off these uh, gut hormones. Um, and so we're actually seeing some new medication development as a result of that kind of research as well. So key organs would be pancreas, liver, and then probably the, the hormones that are released from the, the bowel or the gut. Okay, thank you. Um, back to actually a diet, we, we've heard a few times that, that question, can people with diabetes eat natural sugar, like fruits? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, everything in moderation is a good sort of adage to follow. So there's no absolute restriction on anything. Um, but obviously, if you're eating, you know, huge amounts of fruits or other products with natural sugars, um, you know, all the time throughout the day, like it, you are going to see spikes in blood sugars. Um, it's, you know, it's also important how you're having the, the natural sugar, or how, you're, how you're having the fruit. So for example, like if you have a whole fruit and there's a lot of fiber contained in that fruit, it's going to slow down the absorption of the glucose. Whereas if you have like a juice that's made from fruit, even if it is the whole, um, you know, it, even if it's naturally made juice from a fruit, you're not getting that fiber with it. You're going to see much more of a rapid sort of spike in your blood sugar. So you definitely can have fruit or natural sugars I think the key is sort of moderation how often and how much okay thank you and last question for Dr. Alana Weissman and then we'll uh, welcome Jim for uh, the last remarks um, so how can you use food label to manage your diet that's a really that's a great question um, you know I think it would probably be helpful to talk to a dietitian about specifics. So it's not necessarily my area of expertise, um, but I would say the key things to look at on a food label would be the grams of sugar, the grams of carbohydrates, and then fiber. So as I mentioned, fiber helps with, with slowing down um, the uh, sugar absorption. So you can actually usually subtract the grams of fiber from the grams of carbohydrates. Um, and so I think that would that gives you some idea if you look at how much sugar, how many carbs are in in a serving of the product, and also just looking at the ingredients list. So the ingredients are listed in order of the greatest component. Um, if you think about the percentage of everything making up that product, um, and again with the diet, the common thing about all those diets are that they focus on sort of whole, real, unprocessed foods. So if you look at the ingredients list, and you know the first couple are these you know, chemical names you can't pronounce, that's probably a good indication that it's a pretty processed food product and perhaps not one you want to be having all that much of. Okay, great. Actually, one final question before Jim, because this one came. Jim, Jim, stay with us. Um, can you explain the relationship between stress and diabetes? And I will leave you on that for the last question. 
All right. Um, so there's, if you look up what factors affect blood sugars and someone with diabetes, you'll find like there's hundreds of factors that can affect diabetes. So we know that when someone is stressed and that could be psychological stress or a type of physical stress, that there are stress hormones in the body that go up. So things like cortisol, epinephrine, for example, if you think of like a fight or flight response, those things will go up in response to stress. Generally, those hormones all also raise blood sugars, which makes sense from, a, from an evolution perspective. If you encountered a bear in the woods and you needed to run, you want your blood sugar to be going up, not going down. Um, and so that we know stress over time can cause um, increased blood sugar because of these hormones that are, are higher. Well, what, this has been such a great session, Dr. Wiseman. I'll call you Alana, if I may. Um, you have a, a, a rare skill and a, a great commodity. Uh, which serves the needs of, of our members that have joined us here in the hundreds. Uh, and the rare commodity is being able to explain something as, as simple and as complex as the factors associated with diabetes in very clear, uh, non-emotional terms, which is really important because when anyone gets a, a diagnosis of pre-diabetes or diabetes, there's, there's obviously going to be a big spike in, in stress and, and worry and consequentially uh, in, in their blood sugar. I think you've done such a great job today in responding to the numerous questions we had. Lots more questions uh, we were unable to get to, so we were able to sort of cluster them in, in groupings. And the last one on, um, on uh, the amount of fruit and the kinds of fruit uh, I noticed was uh, very commonly being asked in, in the questions. So to you, a great vote of thanks. Uh, it's so wonderful to have access to a great specialist like you. Uh, we've recorded this session. Um, and for everyone uh, still tuned in, and there's still 276 of you here, we will send you a link to uh, the recording. Please feel free to, to look at it again. Share the link with friends and families who may have an interest in this. And it'll be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, to you, Dr. Wiseman, thank you so much for spending your time in snowy Calgary, and uh, we'll look forward to you uh, returning to Ontario very soon. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.